Good morning. This morning we are um, in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want us to look at a couple of things uh, in this chapter. And I hope this will challenge us in the way that we look at one another, the way that we live our life. First, I want to share with you the opportunity that we have uh, on Wednesday evening. Come and be a part of what we're calling Celebrate. And this will be an opportunity to bring your lawn chairs. We're going to meet right out here in the grassy area. We're going to sing to one another. Uh, and it'll be an opportunity just to, to encourage one another, sing to one another. We're going to have a, a short devotional. Uh, and then we will end with a, a little treat, some drumsticks or ice cream bars or, or something like that, and, and just get, get a chance to, to engage with one another, let the kids play on the playground, and we will uh, be together. Tomorrow is Monday is Friday, and this one is right. I have worked on this one all week long. We're going to be south of the church building uh, in the, at the Dario there. Come and enjoy. You don't have to eat fries. Order a salad if you want to. But let's have lunch together. Let's pray together. Let's, let's fellowship together. It'll be a great opportunity. If it fits into your lunch break, if it fits into to your schedule, come and be a part of that. Then the following Monday, uh, we will be at the Dario in Kernersville. And so I hope that you can be a part of one of those chances for us to engage together. When we think about peace, I want us to understand a couple of things. There is a scripture here in Ephesians chapter 4, and read with me. It says, starting in verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. If you haven't already noticed, I want you to pay attention. This is as if Paul were writing to the South Fork Church. These are some universal truths. It's not just specific to the Ephesian congregation, but this is for all all of us in our engagement, that we are to engage with one another, being completely humble and gentle, be patient and bearing with one another in love. And then in verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep unity this spiritual unity through the bond of peace. I want us to understand what this really looks like this morning because this has really been my overarching theme this whole time that we are in Ephesians. This idea of unity that's being held together in a bond of peace. When I was a teenager, I went to this Christian camp, and the last day, right before the last day, I guess the last day you pack up and you go home, but the last full day, we had what we called the Aquathon, where it was water challenges all around the camp. Aquathon, that's what it was. And, and everywhere you went, you had to do these different challenges, and you were raced, or you were timed, and what was going to be your time, you'd, you'd get a score or whatever, but you were partnered with. And you remember like the old three-legged race where you and a partner had your, your leg tied together. Well, this one was they were given a, a small we were given a small string and our two hands were tied together with a small like old cheap Walmart kite kind of string. And we had to run this course throughout the camp. We had to jump into the swimming pool. We had to go through different obstacles. And if our string broke, which happened really easily, you had to go back and get it tied together. I want us to understand that the bond of peace is something that is fragile, that is difficult to maintain. Think for just a moment about us being wrapped in a three-legged race. Maybe I'd get a volunteer and we could wrap our legs once or twice with just a flimsy piece of toilet paper and try to make our way around this room how difficult that would be. The bond of peace is not this 
euphoric idea that everybody is getting along, that everybody has the same idea, that everybody has the same priorities. No, the bond of peace is something that is shackling us together, that holds us together in a way that is so different from the rest of the world. We had one of our, our police officers, I could bring up some handcuffs and, and we could show you what a bond of, of not peace is looking like, where you were stuck to somebody. And you've already watched these, these movies, these criminals who are escaping and they're, they're shackled together, but when they escape from prison or, or from the, the prison bus, they try to go different ways and they're yanking at one another, trying to figure out what's going on. That's not the bond of peace. The bond of peace is fragile. It is delicate. It is purposeful. And I hope over this morning you will see something that is unique about what God wants within the church. This bond of peace is my responsibility. And I'm pointing at me, but I'm really talking to you because it is our responsibility. It is my responsibility to protect, to engage, to solidify this bond of peace. Peace is not just the time when there's no noise or trouble or, or hard work. But in the midst of all that, we see a different priority. Unity is kept when we are bound in peace. Brothers and sisters, as I look out at this room, I see a varying group of people, that there's ages and economics, there's, there's different political views, there's a whole lot of, of agendas and desires within our lifestyle. But as we gather today, as we commune together as one family, we put all that aside and we raise up only one thing as our true highest priority and desire, and that would be Jesus Christ, God the Father. Brothers and sisters, he, Paul is going to teach us something unique about unity that I think we have overlooked for far too long. Unity or peace is the outcome. Let me go back the right way here. Peace is the outcome when we set our values on these high ideals. Listen to what Paul continues to say as he talks about this. And in chapter 4, verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. One Lord and one faith and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. I want you to notice these ones that Paul draws to our attention, these high ideals of what we are to strive for. There is one body. There is one body. And so many times I've heard preachers get up and they get to this one body thing and they start to list off all the things that we do to become the body. But if you remember in the first three chapters, Paul says, when you believed... God was already calling you. He's talking about the grace that was given to you even while you were still an enemy of Christ. This one body is not anything that we have achieved together. It is not the success of our intellect. It is not the growing accumulation of our achievements. This one body is only because Christ died for you and me. There is one body. There is one spirit. And you were called to one hope. There is one Lord. There is one baptism. One faith, one baptism. And there's one God 
overall. I want us to notice how often our lives, our top priorities fall short of these seven things that Paul lists are as high ideals for our faith and for our unity together. Because there's only one agenda when we leave here. It starts to become my agenda. There's only one pursuit, and it becomes my pursuit. There's only one desire, and it becomes my desire. And we leave here not as a family, not as united, not with one true vision, but with a variety of things that take us in separate different ways, far away often from our Lord and Savior. But I want you to see in these seven things, this unity that's being described, this idea of diversity that's being described, and the idea, again, of the Trinity that is here. I want you to see the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. I want you to see differing ideas being brought into unity. And as you look across the room, I want you to see differing people and what the Spirit will do as He unites us in this bond of peace. Number one, the desire of the Spirit and the body are united in hope. It says that the Spirit and the body are one. Because there is just one hope. There is this calling that is drawing us forward. The body of Christ is being changed because we believe in the Christ who was resurrected. We believe in the hope and the promise that is to come. We are engaging in with the Spirit because of this hope. The Spirit is engaging with the body because it hopes that we will be transformed, that we will be made new, that we will be made different. This hope brings the Spirit and the body together as one. Number two, the path of the Lord and the faithful are united in baptism. This is where we reach and we touch and we connect with Jesus Christ. It is our baptism where we are taking off the old self. We are being clothed in something new. We are being washed and made clean. This is where we engage with a man who walked 2,000 years ago and who still lives today. It is this unity that brings both these ages together as one. And then the Father, God, he unites both you and me. And if we didn't understand the diversity of, of the hope or, or, or the, the body and the spirit, if we didn't understand the difference between Christ and myself, who's trying, striving to be faithful, still a great leap of difference between me and the Messiah. Then look around and see the difference between you and me. On a Sunday morning, Online, there's a thousand million gazillion things we should be, could be doing. Each of us pursuing our own interests and desires. But we join together because we see that there is an eternal, all-powerful, great and gracious God who calls us His children. This morning, I want us to see that we have an opportunity to take action. That we are going to be engaged in what needs to be done in our life. And as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, as he reminds us of a few things, starting in verse 22, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in its attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I want to see what it really means to be made new because I am purposefully allowing myself to be changed. This week, our action is for us to understand that for us to keep the bond of peace, it requires for me to be at work on myself. There is a problem with the South Fork Church of Christ. The bond of peace that is not so easily connected. And the problem is you. You continue to fall short of the glory of God. Amen? 
We talked about that last week, and it was good news because God's grace is so much greater than our weakness. We talked about this because we understand I mess up, but God's Spirit is uniting us as we recognize those weaknesses. Brothers and sisters, this bond of peace is so easily shattered and broken because of our missteps, our misunderstandings. Jesus would say that when we are coming to a situation like this, we're supposed to take the plank out of our own eye before we try to remove the speck from somebody else's. How often do we need to bring up the last 15, 18 months as we talk about the differences and the struggles? How much do we need to talk about the future and what that will look like as we try to wrestle with the differing viewpoints that may be coming, that may try to split us from one another? How much do we need to first take out that plank that is in our eye before we try to remove the speck from somebody else's? How dare we try to uphold some sort of value and position on somebody else when we continually fall short of the glory of God day after day? Let's give grace to one another. Let us pursue peace with one another. Let us engage in this bond. I'm living in a way that I am bound to you in peace. And so, as Paul writes, listen to what he says as he concludes what we call this chapter. He says, therefore, each of you, in verse 25, therefore, each of you must put off the falsehoods and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold Anyone who has been stealing, steal no more, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of resurrection. Redemption, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. Now listen, as he finishes this, this is what we're aiming for. He says, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. You know. There's far too many times in our news when churches are shattered and broken because one side or both sides would not offer compassion or forgiveness. I know of a church that was growing and excited about their their next steps. They were seeing God at work within their community and he even blessed them with the funds and the place to build a new facility. As they dreamt about what this could be, they dreamt of a room like this, a multi-purpose room, where they would be able to engage in all sorts of of sports activities and fellowships and, and seminars and trainings, all sorts of things. But someone decided maybe that room needed to be a little classier. And we should have carpet. Others said, well, you can't play basketball on a carpeted floor very well. And so two sides grew. And over something as silly as carpet, this church lost its influence with one another. The bond of peace was broken for the cost of carpet. Now, those who have been a part of South Fork, you might be able to interject a variety of different things that have caused strife and turmoil within this congregation. Those that are from other places, maybe you can experience, you've had experiences in which other things have brought division within God's church. But over and over and over again, the truth is we've allowed our high ideals to be substituted with something that is cheap and meaningless and pointless. And we have lost the one thing that the world will see something unique and special. 
when we are walking in love and compassion and care for one another, regardless of what is put on the news, regardless of what is happening in our economic world, regardless of what is happening within the medical community, when we put one another above ourselves, regardless of anything else other than to glorify Christ, we have cheapened what God desires for this church. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, and brawling along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. What are you going to do this week? What is your task? What is your work? What is the plank that is in your eye? as he lists out so many things that we need to get rid of or we need to add to our life, are you going to walk out of here just saying, yeah, peace is a good thing and I hope that it happens. Preacher, preach on, but I'm not going to do anything about it. What are you going to do about this job today? The bond of peace will make South Fork, will make God's church rise up and be noticed or we will diminish. We will dim our light and the world will care less. Peace rules the day when Christ rules our hearts. I want to ask you about this church, about the way that you interact with this church. Let me ask you these questions. If this is not the place where tears are understood, where can I go to cry? If this is not the place where my spirit can fly, where do I go to try? If this is not the place where my questions can be asked, where do I go to seek? If this is not the place where my feelings can be heard, where do I go to speak? If this is not the place where you'll accept me as I am, where do I go to be me. If this is not the place where I can try and fall and learn and grow, where can I go? Just me. If we're not going to interact in a way that gives glory and honor to our Father, then our interactions are in vain and cheapened. We have a difficulty of understanding the word peace. Often in our world, the definition of peace is, is given to us really as the time when two sides are reloading and not really engaging in peace. Our understanding of peace is often based on our own value, our own belief system. I read two stories this last week. There were two friends on the battlefield, and then there were two guys on a dock enjoying the summer. And our idea of peace would quickly determine one place was peaceful and one place was not. But the story is told back in 1928 in Massachusetts, there was a man who was out on the dock fishing. Another man was walking across, and as he stumbles, he falls into the water, unable to swim. The man who was fishing looks over, sees the other one a few stalls down, struggling for life, but he turns his attention back to his rod and reel and what he's about to catch and the other individual perishes under the water. Two friends enlist in the army for World War I. They go through training together. They are sent off together, and they find themselves on a foreign field battling together. And as they are coming up out of the trenches, one buddy goes a little bit farther than the other and is mortally wounded. 
The call for retreat comes and the other buddy goes back to the foxhole. It's there that he realizes his buddy is out there hurting. The gunfire is continuing to to go over the field and there's no good way for him to get out. As he tries to make his escape, the sergeant pulls him back into the trench and says, you go out of here, you will be killed. You stay here. Over the next few hours, as the sun sets, as the, the firefight continues, he hears his buddy anguishing in pain. And in the cover of night, when the sergeant wasn't looking, one friend leaves his foxhole and he goes to retrieve his other. And the story seemingly does not have a happy ending because the one who is going to save his friend is now mortally wounded. The friend, life expires there on the battlefield. And as the two men come back into the foxhole, the sergeant is angry and desperate and frustrated and he yells at this man. He says, you are wounded and dying and your friend is dead. What good is that? And the man in his last moments says, my friend, when I got there, all he said was, I knew you would come. Church, are we going to be the church that sits idly by and lets one another drown in sin and difficulty? Are we going to be the type that will get up out of our comfort and strive for a relationship that is bound in peace? As Paul writes to the Ephesian church, we see a calling for our own lives. And I pray that you will see the opportunity before you, before us, to be engaged in a way that transforms our lives and transforms the lives of one another. And when we do that, this world will take notice. Our elders are standing by. They would love to to pray with you and counsel with you. Outside, there's a a truck filled with with corn and tomatoes from the Branch Ranch. And so you know Charlie and Lisa are going to be here for a while as they just love on us in, in a beautiful way. And so conversation right there is made ready for you. Our other elders are standing by. Our office is open throughout the week. We would love to pray with you and study with you. We'd love to counsel you and encourage you. We would love to see us engaging and working on that bond of peace. If you don't know Christ, if you have not made him your Lord and your Savior, there's no better time than to give your life to him right now. Be clothed in his righteousness. Let your sins be washed away as you join him in baptism. Brothers and sisters, let's stand together. Let's encourage each other with this song and let us engage in the bond of peace. Lord, take my life. May 